No, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm speaking in the English. all of you good afternoon welcome to the 23rd international service learning conference we are transmitting live we're broadcasting live over streaming it's 303 p.m. in Buenos Aires August 26 and besides the YouTube broadcasting we also have two channels for the simultaneous interpretation into English and Portuguese so first let me welcome especially all of you who are participating for the first time in our seminar. We have almost 3,000 people registered, half of which have never participated in these seminars before. So let me tell you what CLIS is about. We are a civil not-for-profit association founded in 2002 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Our mission is to contribute to the growth of a participatory community in Latin America from the development of service learning projects. We have a network all over Argentina. We also have an office in Montevideo, Uruguay, and we conduct activities not only in Latin America, but worldwide to promote the development of the educational proposal of service learning we implement support programs for educational institutions and civil uh, society organizations that participate in service learning by providing funding and technical assistance. We offer face-to-face -face, uh, training, online training, and comprehensive support to institutions and educators at all levels, as well as youth and community organizations who develop research programs, quantitative and qualitative research and service learning in Latin America, in association with universities and national and foreign institutions. We publish books, materials that are available for free in our website. We provide advice to governments and institutions for the promotion of service learning. And we also promote and coordinate networks for the promotion of service learning nationally, regionally, and internationally. Let me take a minute to tell you about this seminar, a little bit about a history of it. The first international seminar was held by the Ministry of Education in Argentina in 1997 in addressing uh, public officials at the time and teachers. But as time went by, this seminar became the most important annual meeting in Latin America for experts and the institutions that promote service learning. 
since 2011, CLIES has assumed the coordination and organization of this seminar. And every year, with the support of donors and volunteers, CLIES had made sure that all the activities continued being free. This is the first time we do it fully virtually. And we received 2,800 registrations from 59 countries. Most from Argentina, of course, and Chile, Bolivia, Mexico, Peru, but with participants from all over the world that right now might be um, watching us at not so convenient schedules, perhaps. So I'd like to thank particularly the collaboration of our allies from the Ibero-American Network for Service Learning and the different regional uh, networks we work with whose support has allowed us to have this wide reach. How did we think about this seminar? Let me make some administrative announcements. All of you that have registered, you have already received the agenda where you can download it from our website, seminar, seminario.clice.org, and there you can find the plenary activities and the simultaneous sessions. The plenary sessions, as this one that we're having now, are broadcast over YouTube. They are fully open, regardless of who registered prior, priorly or not. You can, all of, of course, download the link and share it with your friends that haven't registered, but they can uh, listen to these seminars. And the breakout sessions on Thursday and Friday in the afternoon will be held over Zoom. And only those that registered have received the link to participate in the corresponding uh, concurrent sessions. If you have registered, you still haven't received the information, please check your spam in your email. And if you still don't find it, please send an email to info at clients.org.ar. We have a huge team behind all this. We've made a huge effort for this seminar to be of the quality and organization we've always had. I'd like to thank and recognize all the team at CLIES for this because they've been working in the past few weeks in a really amazing way. Anyway, this is our first fully virtual experience. So all of you that are listening to us, please bear with us and um, bear with us for any unexpected event, technical or non-technical, that may come up during these three days. And to close this brief introduction, I'd like to speak about the hard moment we're going through, this global pandemic that has uh, faced, uh, we faced us with new challenges. In this case, this is very important for the educational systems. And it has deepened other challenges that the practice of service learning has been facing for a long time. Particularly, I'd like to focus on Latin America that for decades was the most unequal region in the world. And now it's the region with the highest number of fatalities for COVID-19. This pandemic that is added to many other crises in the continent puts solidarity and caring at the core and the learning focused on community service becomes an essential tool for the training of our students. So with this new issue, we celebrate the continuity of the seminars as an expression of an innovative educational movement that keeps growing based on the creativity of teachers and students, volunteers, social leaders, the organizations that promote it, even more in these special times we are living. I'd like to pass the floor then to the president of CLIES, Dr. Jorge San Martin, to address the floor in this opening session. Jorge, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm Jorge San Martin, and it's an honor for me to be the president of CLIES, the civil organization. It's a pleasure for me to open this 23rd uh, International Service Learning Conference. As Enrique was saying, this is the first seminar that is fully developed online, which implies not only a huge challenge for the organizers, but also the possibility of having a large number of participants from many countries, a truly international seminar. We also have the satisfaction of having valuable regional and international speakers that given the possibilities of uh, communications, we will have the luxury to have them with us sharing their knowledge and experience. We also celebrate the 20 years of the creation of the Presidential Award in Argentina and the first program of service learning in our country. And we also celebrate the first two decades of the first book, Solidarity as Pedagogy, by Professor Nieves Tapia. 
and we also celebrate the 15th anniversary of the Ibero-American Service Learning Network. From Clice, we would like to share with you our joy for some milestones in the promotion of service learning in our region and in the world. Monday, this Monday, we formally launched a global program, Universitate, that will promote institutional policies for service learning at Catholic universities throughout the world. And it will offer research and materials for all the higher education institutions in the world. It's a network of prestigious specialists and universities from all over the world that are working for this purpose. And we invite you to visit the website, universitate.org. Another milestone was that in the past year, we were able to collaborate with colleagues from Eastern and Central Europe that have concluded the first edition of the Regional Service Learning Award. We would like to express our congratulations to them. And we're happy to see that there are more and more awards that give visibility to the importance of solidarity among our students, among them the one that we've been organizing in Uruguay with our partners there. And this year, we launched another one with the Brazilian Service Learning Network that has opened their first call yesterday. And finally, we would like to invite you to help us promote the Diploma on Service Learning that is beginning its second cohort. This diploma is organized with the Organization of Ibero-American States and the University of 3 de Febrero. I have two comments to make on a personal note to mark the celebration of this seminar. We have seen in this uh, 2020 that the three words that make up our proposal have resonated with force, learning, service, and solidarity. All of you must have learned something new in these times. And we also have to unlearn many things from the way we wash our hands many times a day, using the face masks, following the special protocols, even learning to play an instrument or using Zoom and being more familiar with technology to celebrate a birthday party, things that perhaps we wouldn't have done in normal times. Our time now was used to learn new things. Learning, again, takes a key part in the lives of human beings. Service occupied and still occupies a relevant space in these times of lockdown and restrictions. Service is present and became evident in many brothers and sisters, especially dedicated to being close to those that suffering, like the healthcare personnel, nurses, people dedicated to caring for the elderly, security staff, those that um, deal with those that are excluded, those that started cooking in uh, soup kitchens, and teachers in their daily work with their students, both from virtual uh, scenarios with hard efforts and creativity to keep educating all the students. And in many other cases, also moving through long physical distances to take the educational materials to the students that don't have access to technology. And finally, solidarity, understood as compassion for the other. Never before we've had such a true certainty of what happens to the world almost in real time. And in many cases, we've put ourselves in the place of the others. We've done this among governments, countries, cities, neighbors, and families. We've been alert to what happens to the other. That's why I feel that this is a very special moment to keep training ourselves, learning about service as a tool for transforming our heart and people. And my second comment has to do with receiving this seminar as a gift. The organizers have worked for months with a very special dedication to reach today with the best we have to offer, valuable content, our passion, and the commitment for disseminating service learning. So take this as a gift, as a present, and be prepared not just to learn, but also to enjoy it. So without further ado, I will pass the floor again to Enrique, and I hope that this new learning will make you feel enthusiastic, and this will be the, the trigger for new projects. Jorge. Thank you, Jorge. I must confess 
that we have 500, 600 people connected. So let's try to relax a little bit. We wanted the streaming to work out well, and it is working well, so we are very happy. Jorge said something that I forgot to mention in my introductory remarks. This conference is part of an international week devoted to service learning in Buenos Aires. This year, we had the Universitat uh, launch on Monday and the meeting of the Ibero-American Service Learning Network on Tuesday. So now we started with the conference. I'm going to ask the technical team to help me with a couple of videos. We have representatives from Uruguay. As I told you, Clyde has uh, representatives in Uruguay. So we have greetings from Sandra Rodriguez, the permanent representative of the Uruguayan Office of the Organization of Ibero-American States, and Gonzalo Baroni, who is the Secretary of Education of the Ministry of Education and Culture of Uruguay. So let's hear their greetings. In 2014, we uh, met uh, Edina from Bosnia. Let's see if we can have the video. Good afternoon to you all. It is a pleasure for us to be here with you once again and to be part of the opening session of a new international conference on service learning. In my position as director of the OEI office in Uruguay, I'm joining you. I would like to especially thank Nieves and Kleis for inviting me to share with you some words in this special place that has had such an important role, uh, especially in this context. Uh, I congratulate you for organizing this conference in a virtual format and also for all the activities that CLIS has been carrying out since the start of the pandemic with different actions that aim at reflecting on how to establish a coordination and a link between civil society organizations' actions and the educational system. In this regard, I would like to especially congratulate the teachers, the headmasters and headmistresses, the students, and the leaders of civil society organizations, the members of communities that on a daily basis and in very complex situations and conditions have continued with their service learning activities during the pandemic. From the OEI, I would like to ratify our commitment uh, to continuing our work with CLIS as we have done for many years. And in particular, in Uruguay, we have already started with uh, some joint work with the CLIS office here. So I wish you all the best for this conference, and I'll be listening carefully to all the experiences that uh, you will share with us that will surely uh, increase our learning. Thank you. All my greetings to you. And uh, let's make the most of this space for exchange. Thank you. From the Ministry of Education and Culture of Uruguay, we would like to congratulate you for organizing the 23rd International Conference on Service Learning. We see this event as a positive experience. There will be an exchange at the international level among educators, partners, civil society, and governments who will talk about uh, service activities and pedagogy in the classroom. We see that Uruguay over the last six months has led the educational aspects in Mercosur, and we can uh, add a contribution to this action. I would like to highlight the work being done by CLIS together with Uruguay, Argentina, and other countries in the region. I wish you all the best for this uh, conference. Thank you. So we are back here. 
I would like to thank the previous speakers from Uruguay for their um, remarks. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Graciela Morgade, who is from the Ministry of uh, Education of Argentina, who is the, and the Secretary for Participation and Educational Democratization. Thank you. I come here on behalf of Minister Nicolás Trota. We are uh, having very busy days, uh, so I was asked to represent the ministry here. I would like to congratulate you first for organizing the 23rd edition of the International Conference. This is a reason to be happy, and I also want to compliment um, Klaes, Enrique, Jorge, Nieves, all the organizers for your efforts. Uh, we've been together in so many places, and I would like to underline, as you have just said, in this particularly complex and difficult context, the fact that uh, you continue with your activities. I was thinking about this conference uh, and how solidarity um, works in opposition to selfishness. And in order to do service-oriented uh, practices, we need to work as a community. We need to build a community. We know that selfishness uh, is one of the scourges that, re that brings about economic problems. And unfortunately, we, all of our countries have some of this. So it is important to uphold the value of solidarity, of caring, not just at an individual level, but also at a collective, institutional, and political level. Nieves was reminding me of something that I need to highlight, that the law on education for Argentina mentioned the possibility for schools to have out-of-school spaces to focus on service-related activities, as well as the need and the convenience of maintaining links with different organizations in the local communities in order to carry out these service-oriented activities. But what is the common ground that we find here? that gathers us all around uh, the policy of the Ministry of Education right now. Through different paths, we are all working uh, for social justice. Uh, these are projects that um, or bills that recognize uh, individuals as equals with rights. And this uh, relates to their quality of life. And this is an ethical standing, a powerful notion. Both governments, through their policies and civil society organizations, converge virtuously at this point, because we know that although the main responsibility for guaranteeing equality and social justice lies in the hands of the governments. We know that governments cannot work alone. They need also to engage with other initiatives, with other actions, uh, with the grassroots, as we usually say, with the territories, especially more now in this time of pandemic. We are celebrating 23rd years of the first conference, 20 years of an award. But at present, we see a repositioning of solidarity. What is the meaning of solidarity and caring today? And as the previous speakers well said, it is obvious that the educational system is giving us uh, grounds for us to think that we can be optimistic optimistic in terms of our will because we need to continue working for social justice, for equality. We know it has been very difficult to 
continue working and living during these difficult times. Uh, the conference is a good example. This is the current context today that pushes us to reflect again on our service learning practices and to have service at the core of policies in this effort to achieve justice. So this is an opportunity for celebration, for continuing with these projects. We are looking for ways of uh, implementing the celebration for the 20th anniversary of the Presidential Awards. So the Ministry of Education continues working hand in hand with class. So thanks for inviting me. Thank you, Graciela. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your kind words. Well, the opening session starts taking shape now. We are going to miss hugs uh, and um, chats in the corridors do, um, or mate for those who are from Uruguay and Argentina. Um, those who have come to our conferences know that that is a characteristic of our face-to-face -face meetings. But now we are trying to adapt to the new circumstances. If we were in the same room, I would ask Graciela and Jorge to come off the stage and to join the audience. But it, this is not possible now. So I'm going to just have Nieves now on camera, and we are going to start with the keynote presentation. It is my turn to introduce uh, Nieves formally. She is the founder of CLAS since 1997 until 2010. She coordinated the service learning programs of the Ministry of Education in Argentina. She has delivered uh, hundreds of workshops and conferences in all continents, and she has published uh, several books, including Solidarity as mm -hmm. Uh, pedagogy at school and other uh, books. She has been recognized uh, with several awards and prizes. She is member of the IRSLI. And in 2019, she was um, um, appointed with a uh, um, as uh, with a membership. Uh, she's also working for, with Flaxo. And she now leads another workshop. But this is what her bio says, but she is a generous person. This is not here in writing. In particular, this was the 20th year that we have been working together. I've been working with her for 20 years, and it is always a pleasure to have her with us. I know that many of you are chatting now, but you will see see that in the description of the conference, you have a link to a form to ask questions. You can enter that form in YouTube. You have the description for this video streaming. And there you can uh, click on a link that will take you to a form for you to ask questions. Imagine that we won't be able to read them all, but we will collect some of the questions. Usually when we are in a um, face-to-face meeting, we just uh, collect different pieces of paper with questions. In this case, we are going to receive your forms, uh, and, but we need you to ask questions through that form and just leave the chat box for uh, just uh, greeting one another. So it's uh, half past three. We are doing great with time. Everything is working very well. So I'm going to give the floor to Nieves. Thank you, Kike. Thank you for reminding me that we have been here uh, together for 20 years. I can imagine that you were very young 20 years ago. As Kike said, we would have loved to have the hugs, the mate, the croissants, the coffee breaks with all of you in person. But let me share with you a photograph from other times. I see a lot of people connected now through our channels, and we are a bigger crowd than what we usually have in our face-to-face -face, uh, conferences. So uh, this virtual reality has given us the opportunity to have a greater reach 
uh, people did not have to take a bus or a plane to attend our conference. So welcome uh, to all of you, but more especially those who are newcomers. For those of you who have been here with us uh, for several conferences, uh, and those who are newcomers need to know that our conference is not just an academic event. It is a space for gathering. It is a meeting point. It is a space where we believe that caring, solidarity is a value and a practice, but also a pedagogical proposal that um, gives a leadership uh, to youth that uh, takes a stake for uh, the leadership of communities. But it, above all, it is a meeting space. And although we cannot have the physical hugs, I imagine that behind the screens there are a lot of familiar faces, so many colleagues, so many people who over the years have uh, joined us in this path. Uh, let me start with a song because sometimes art expresses things much better than science. Two years ago, we finished our conference with a song by Atahualpa Chupanqui that is called Los Hermanos, um, the siblings. And I think that this is what uh, these images represent. Atahualpa Chupanqui says, I have so many siblings that I cannot count them in the valley, in the mountains, in the fields, and at sea. And I would also say today that we have colleagues, brothers and sisters who have joined us at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, others who are on the other side of the ocean before having dinner, some colleagues in Asia who are joining us before they go to bed. And as Chupanqui says, what brings us together is in the fact that we have warm hands, that we uh, adore uh, friendship with an open sky and with the strength to look for that because we have heart and will. And we can know one another just by looking at one another. I was looking at the chat and I saw so many people that uh, feel identified with this, uh, this proposal and we cannot see their faces, but we know that we share this horizon. As Graciela said, we share this uh, objective of building a fairer uh, world, a better world for the whole of humankind. And I must confess that Chupanqui's lyrics uh, resonated with me a lot today because in one of its verses it says, among us are our dead, um, we are leaving no one behind. Yesterday after the meeting of the Ibero-American Service Learning Network, I started receiving a lot of messages from our Chilean colleagues telling me that um, Monica Jimenez uh, had passed away. If you read the papers, the papers will tell you that Monica was a brave advocate of human rights during the Pinochet dictatorship government, that she was also a president of the Temuco Catholic University, a university where the indigenous uh, youth uh, can uh, learn about their ancestors, that she was a founder of a network at the university level. She was one of the uh, founders and advocates of university social responsibility. She was also Minister of Education, and she was Minister of Education during the first uh, time in, uh, term in office of President Bachelet. We can have different opinions, but we would like to re uh, remember her because of her contribution to the Service Learning Awards uh, in Chile, and also because of her attendance in our conferences. In 20 11, Monica came to Buenos Aires, and that was an excuse for a lot of Chileans who were in Buenos Aires right now at uh, that time, got together after the sessions 
to start what today is the large Chilean service learning network. Monica participated a couple of times in the meetings of our Ibero-American service learning network, but I would like to remember her as an elder sister, as someone who taught us a lot through her writings, through her lectures, but more particularly through her action, her life, her commitment. And I just wanted to uh, pay tribute to her already at the beginning. If you usually pray, pray for her. And we would like to thank her for her great deeds, and I am sure she will still be with us during these days. So I hope that um, my makeup is still intact. So we are going to start now with the formal presentation. And um, we decided that we would uh, devote this presentation to service learning in times of pandemic. And uh, as Enrique said at the beginning, coronavirus has changed all settings, but in Latin America, as well as in other parts of the world, we are uh, dealing with this pandemic without um, overcoming all the previous pandemics that we had caused by cholera, dengue, also poverty, injustice, educational inequality, so we are facing very challenging times. So thinking that this is the first seminar for many people, I wanted to start by telling you very briefly what we understand by service learning. And we think there's nothing better than starting from the description of what some actual institutions have done. And I selected an old story and a new story that I think are very representative of what we understand by service learning. In the picture, you can see Ramiro. He was then in sixth grade of the uh, School for the Visually Impaired in Patagonia, in Argentina. In the Braille uh, class, the teacher could hear him complain because he couldn't go out to play with his friends. So the discussion came up as why aren't streets prepared for the visually impaired? And the teacher was smart enough not to put herself in the place of saying, poor little boy, what's going to happen to him? But he, she rather appealed to the leadership of those 11-year-olds so that they could say, what can we do about this problem? And what they did was to dedicate the Braille classes to writing, instead of anything and any dictation, writing the names of each street and each monument in their city until they had all those signs in Braille that uh, were sent to a technical school across the street. They printed them, and both schools donated those signs to the municipalities. So. General Roca, the city, was in 2001 the first Argentine city that was fully adapted to the blind. So there is the capability of doing a lot with very little. That is what can be done with these projects. The children had to write Braille very well, so they learned that it was quality learning because they wanted the signs to be perfect because they didn't want to make any mistakes. But they also provided a very important service, not only to the community of the blind in the city, but a contribution to the fact that that city was seen as a more inclusive place. On the other side of the world, now we see a much more recent experience in Singapore. A huge city, highly developed, very rich, a beautiful city, where in many cases, the historical ties between generations are broken, and many elderly people live on their own, isolated, and they fall into depression. Somebody was telling me, somebody that knows a lot about life in Singapore, that there are old people there that died out of starvation, not because they don't have food, 
but because they just let themselves die out of lack of will to eat. So the student, uh, the students at psychology came up with this great idea where they adopted some elderly people. They invite them to go out and to take some fresh air and to talk and to chat. And as advanced students of psychology, through those talks and chats, they can also accompany them, identifying what is happening with them and helping them reconnect themselves with the reality of the others and have a more hopeful approach to life. It's an excellent idea, an excellent practice for the students, but at the same time, it's a service activity that is very specific and very proper to the reality of the community. This is what we mean when we speak of service learning. We could define it briefly by saying that it's learning by doing, as uh, John Dewey said, learning by doing together to the service of a common good. From a perspective of Paolo Freire, we could say that it's reflection and action that transforms reality. Paolo Freire always reminded us that if reflection didn't lead to action, then it was just um, it just remained in an intellectual thing. But we define it briefly as a project, an activity, an action, a service action that is actively led by the students and that is intentionally coordinated with learning contents. As we will see later, service learning is not just any volunteer work. It's a very specific way of service where we know what we're going to do for the community, but we also know what we're going to learn along the way. The truth is that I'm sure that many of those that are listening to us, even if you have never heard of service learning, if you haven't read the literature, perhaps many of you have invented service learning projects on your own. Because one of the nice things about this pedagogical proposal is that very often it comes from the bottom, from the creativity of the educators, from the students themselves. And very often, this takes different names. We could go around the world and see hundreds of different names that are used for these practices beyond how the professionals have defined it. We identify service learning based on three characteristics that are very specific. As you see, the generic medicines that you can buy in the drugstore or you buy a certain brand, well, we have these three components. If you have these three components, we have the generic drug of service learning. We have a service that means that we are working with the community and not only for the community. And let me uh, dwell on this a little because the practices of service learning have been developed for at least one century in Latin America. In other places, perhaps even longer. And those that patented it or baptized it were some colleagues from colleges in the southern US during Luther King's times and civil rights. And they called it service learning. And very often in Spanish, we translate service learning as aprendizaje servicio, the literal translation. But we thought it was important to add to that in Spanish and in other language, other languages, this concept of solidarity. Because solidarity is not the same as other forms of service that may be vertical, may be downwards, may be charity, whereas Solidarity is always horizontal. It always establishes reciprocality relations. And when we say that our projects have this content of solidarity, we means that we, we mean that they are projects that we do with the people at the community and that we do not think of it just uh, think of them just as the beneficiaries of what we can do from our organization, our school, but we are also beneficiaries of them because we are learning from the community and we 
are understanding new things based on our contact with them. And we're going back to this later on. So it's it includes solidarity. It is actively led by the students from beginning to end. And for us, this is very important because nobody learns from seeing others do something. You can learn something, but you learn much more when you do it yourself. And in that sense, for us, service learning is also a way of giving space and leadership and centrality to those subjects that are learning. What in the pedagogical theory says that the experts of centrality of the learning subject, but then ends up being, well, you have to study what I told you for the test. And if you don't repeat what I told you, then you're going to fail the test. On the contrary, service learning is about opening the space to the leadership, creativity, initiative, and the practice of children, adolescents, the youth, so that they are the ones that uh, carry out these service activities. And the third characteristic, and this is our, the, where we are the leaders as educators, is that we have to know that besides those service objectives that we determine with the community, we are the ones that have to know what are the learning objectives what content will be included in the curricula, how we're going to include some reflection activities about the practice so that it just ends up a naive practice, how we're going to develop the skills and the competencies that are necessary for the citizens, for work, for conducting research on reality. This is a very brief summary. And then if you look at your materials, you're going to find uh, more details. The truth is that today, service learning is a global educational movement. In each cultural context, it finds different strengths. In Africa, it finds the roots in the Ubuntu, that in China, it finds the roots in the millennial philosophies. But all over the world, it leads to the leadership of students and the youth. And all over the world, it helps overcome the fragmentation of traditional education. That we are always like, you know, pulling and pushing between the theory and the practice, the curriculum and real life, scientific training and citizen training as if they were opposite things whether we, if we do things in the classroom or outside, where we are inside the educational community or the community as a whole. One of the most beautiful things about service learning is that it helps us articulate everything, generate a consistent project where in the same project we can test the practice, we can apply what we've learned in the classroom, apply that in real life, and where because we are using scientific content, we are participating as citizens. Let me give you just one of the thousands of examples I could give you from around the world. This picture, I love it because it's from a high school in Patagonia. It's from an area in the city that is quite uh, poor. We call them in Argentina slums or in other countries, they call it different names, camps, campamentos, or shanty towns. In this high school, with these children that had been expelled from other schools because apparently they were not uh, good enough so as to graduate from high school, in that school, they started to um, be concerned because one of the students lived a hundred kilometers away, but he couldn't have contact with his family because his family lived in um, Mapuche, an indigenous community that had no electricity and there was no way of having a communication with them except by letter that sometimes uh, took days to get there. Finally, these students, motivated by this solidarity with uh, their friend, started asking the technology teacher whether they could do something about it. And what they did was to build this wind generator turbine. They learned how to do it by checking with engineers. They found materials for recycling. And as this school did it, 
many other schools did the same in Patagonia, so that the wind in Patagonia could be used for the service of these isolated um, settlements in Patagonia to have renewable energy. Of course, this is a very specific and concrete contribution. These teenagers did this and they continue doing this because many of these schools continue working on these projects and they are contributing to the local sustainable development. What sometimes we speak about, uh, we adults, but we don't always enforce it. But apart from this, they put the central contents of their formation in practice, their technical, scientific, and humanistic uh, training. And they developed what the experts of education for the 21st century have called the soft competencies, the knowledge for the 21st century, problem solving, teamwork, creativity, that so often in the classroom, we do as if we were developing these things, but we don't always do. The truth is that the scientific content and the citizen training and training for solidarity, for empathy, for self-esteem, all comes together in a project for service learning that is well done. So as we believe in this comprehensive education that has all the benefits of project-based learning that for universities has all the participatory um, components but cannot be done without these three actors students educators and the community because we believe in this proposal we know that here the community the territory real life for us is at the same time a space for participation and a space for learning the pictures there are from a school in the city of Mar del Plata on the coast in Argentina that for many years and also during the pandemic have been working for having a rational access to drinking water and the protection of the water in their community. Those students learn at the lab in the high school. It's a chemical um, course, but they learn so much more when they go out and they test the water in the streams, in the area, in the lake, and when they talk with their neighbors about how to preserve the water. So far, then, this is what very, very briefly we know about service learning. But as the great Uruguayan writer Mario Benedetti used to say, when we thought we had all the answers, suddenly all the questions changed. And that little virus appeared and suddenly we started wondering how can we educate and how can we continue doing service learning during the pandemic. And I would like to say that educating in the in times of the pandemic, we all know that it has been an adventure. I think and I say this as an old history professor. When we were we were in an institution that has hundreds of years of history and beyond the innovations of computers and screens, we anyway kept having classrooms that have a centennial tradition of the dialogue and coexistence between educators and students. Suddenly, all over the world, we had 24 or 48 hours to make a big leap from these 500 years of history to a new history that for most of us was quite unknown. I think we've all felt like the teacher there grabbing our head and many parents have had to reinvent themselves as uh, home educators. And we know it hasn't been an easy demand. It is not an easy thing. Those of us in education know how stressful it is and how creativity and how much courage has been developed throughout these months. So very briefly, I would like to underline three things. First is to what extent has the pandemic forced us to 
look face to face to the educational inequality that even in the most developed countries has become evident because not all students have the same technological resources if they have any. And this has been a very strong call for attention. My son is also a history teacher, tells me the world has taken us a test uh, without any warning. And I told him, I told you that we should have paid attention to the fact that everybody should have access to technology. But the truth is that in many countries, this surprise test didn't uh, find us well prepared. The truth is that from the educational policies, it has also been quite unequal what has been done. I mean, from places where the schools have kept offering uh, food uh, support and countries that had very sophisticated systems of uh, remote uh, learning and platforms, and also some countries that not only did not have any platforms, but didn't have any educational TV or radio, and they had to improvise everything suddenly. So within that framework, there's a third and final thing I would like to mention, that is the huge creativity and vocation and commitment of so many teachers that from this virtuality and from also visiting remote places with their own car to distribute the materials to the students, they have made it possible for many students to keep having access to education. We know that we are still indebted to millions of students all over the world, and we have to keep moving forward in this direction. But without going into that, because we're still learning all this, there are many online lectures, even books have been written about this that have been published in these six months. We will keep learning about this, but I wanted to tell you some things that we've been learning in these months. These are draft, so to speak, learnings. Here on the screen, you will see a map. This is updated on a daily basis because we see more and more uh, dots here every day. We want all of you to tell us uh, where you are carrying out any service-oriented activities during the pandemic. We have a lot here in Latin America because we are part of the network, but uh, what have we learned? That in many places, the fragmentation of the educational system has been replicated in this new virtual reality. And so we have video conferencing on the one hand, we have donations on the other side, and they take separate paths. But we also see that service learning still continues. I have uh, just two examples out of the many students in the School of Medicine and Nursing who joined a program for vaccinating the elderly against the flu. And the elderly had to stay also in a queue when they wanted to go to the bank. So they were offered a seat and they were offered a vaccine while they were waiting. Then on the other picture, we have students from a vocational training school that uh, makes clothes and they have used the machines and their knowledge and their vocational training practices to produce garments for hospital practitioners. So this kind of experiences uh, show us that it is possible to continue doing service learning in times of pandemic and we need to go back to some tools uh, that uh, we described perhaps in uh, the first few conferences. And this was originally the sign 20 years ago and Stanford University. In class, we have been adapting this tool. Imagine that on the vertical axis, you have a thermometer that measures from 
um, high to low, the quality of service and the horizontal axis shows us how much intended uh, learning has happened in those projects. So this defines four quadrants and the first one until further notice uh, has been suspended. That is uh, going out uh, to uh, do some field trips without any service uh, goal. The typical field trips that are not taking place right now in these circumstances. On the other quadrant, we have donations, campaigns, activities um, that usually take place when there is a flood or a natural disaster. We continue doing that because we are in the middle of an emergency as a result of COVID-19. So we have donations of food or blood or different campaigns that still take place. And they have different levels uh, of service. Um, they do not provide the full solution. They help, but they have no learning objectives associated to them because the goal here is to try to provide help. On the upper quadrants, we have the volunteering programs that have no link to the curricular content. Um, a rule for my country, habitat uh, programs, support programs in which engineering students will teach uh, reading and writing to small children, students in different schools of psychology or architecture that painted the walls of a house that is part of a volunteer effort without any a related uh, learning goal in Argentina, in the province of Córdoba. Uh, we know that now they are facing big fires uh, and we send all our support to our colleagues in Córdoba and also colleagues that are in Minnesota that are, are being, uh, in California, sorry, that are being uh, also affected by these um, fires because of global warming. But uh, here you see a picture of people getting ready to uh, start that volunteering action. It doesn't involve any specific learning objective, but there may be some unplanned learning that may have a strong impact on the life of young children and youth. Many of us connected today are working in this area because we engage in some volunteering or service-oriented action when we were young or in our childhood. So although they do not have an academic uh, or curricular value, these projects are still very important and our organizations can organize them systematically. But finally, when we speak about service learning, we speak about projects that have the same academic rigor as a field trip, the same academic rigor as a classroom work, the same service and solidarity component as a volunteering program. In this picture, you will see an example of the Uni for Drug Production, the School of Exact Sciences at the National University of La Plata in Argentina. This is an experience that has uh, taken place for a number of years now. In, the, in 2001, with the crisis, they started producing generics for distribution to healthcare units in the peripheral areas of the city. So here they allow the students of pharmacy to do some professional practices and also to meet the needs of the population in the more vulnerable areas of the city. They were producing repellent to prevent uh, dengue infections. Um, fortunately, in La Plata, there are Import, uh, there is a big uh, number of cases, and now they are also producing hand sanitizer. So, what is it that we have learned with this quadrant, especially with the quadrant on service learning during the pandemic? That we have found creative ways of continuing our service learning work mainly um, in three ways. 
through a virtual means, uh, some face-to-face -face activity, and through a hybrid or combined format when you have part of the activities taking place virtually and the other part in person. I want to leave enough uh, time for questions, so let me briefly talk about this. There is a whole workshop devoted in this conference to virtual service learning. In the Complutense University from Madrid, um, the students volunteer as to provide tuition to uh, students that had to sit for text and they had no one to help them in Singapore. Uh, students in the physical education and gerontology program started uh, teaching gym classes virtually to the elderly because they couldn't go out. Some primary and secondary education schools uh, that have created digital news programs, tutorials, educational programs and shows, a lot of creative uh, options to continue collaborating during the pandemic through a virtual format. But if we just moved from the physical reality to the virtual environment, we would be missing something because face-to-face uh, -face solidarity is still essential. As the students from the School of Architecture reminded us in Cordoba, in order to stay at home, you have to have a home. And also kitchens, uh, dining uh, rooms that have been created or set up because there's so much need remind us that people die of hunger, not only of coronavirus, and that there are many chronic diseases uh, that um, require our physical support. Of course, in safe conditions and understanding the risks of practicing service and solidarity actions in times of pandemic. I chose this uh, photograph because the young person you see here in this kitchen complies with all the safety protections to protect himself and to protect others from the infection with the virus. But this is not always the case because sometimes we are very brave, but also we are quite reckless. And other times we are so careful that we uh, are not brave enough. So the truth is that throughout Latin America and throughout the world, we have seen brilliant uh, service learning experiences done face to face in the times of pandemic. Peruvian students that went back to the university in the middle of a terrible uh, situation. You know that Peru has been heavily affected by the pandemic and they went back to uh, repair the um, ventilators in the hospital so that they could save life from the university. Students in health-related programs in the University of Buenos Aires that have uh, collaborated uh, with vaccination, uh, um, with donation, blood donation campaigns, and also testing campaigns. And I'm mentioning these experiences not because they are just uh, experiences of uh, assistance being provided. Um, these students are acquiring a professional knowledge that will transform the rest of their lives. Also, in secondary schools and in vocational training centers, we have seen beautiful experiences. Here you see one from a training center in San Rafael in Mendoza, Argentina, where they made face masks and gowns. A secondary school that um, went back to the lab because in their neighborhood they didn't have enough hand sanitizer, so they decided to produce that uh, from the lab at school. And here they are not wearing gloves because they are trying their product, and others that combined uh, virtual uh, um, knowledge with um, products that have to be given in person. And you will be able to see this experience in the 
session dedicated to experiences of service learning during the pandemic. This comes from Salta, from the north of Argentina, where students did some research. And with some online help from their sciences teachers, they developed this super sophisticated mask to, that was donated to the hospital, the school. Uh, gave permission to the teacher to take the 3D printer to their home. Um, they produced this mask, and then these masks were distributed by the teacher to the hospital. So virtually, um, in a combined fashion, many found creative ways to continue doing service learning during the pandemic. And in the last part of my talk, I would like to delve into more detail about the different types of services we can offer because sometimes we roll out um, emergency response. Um, you, we know that instead of giving somebody the fish, we have to teach that person how to fish. But sometimes if you don't give the fish, uh, nobody will be strong enough to start fishing. And as a dear friend of mine used to say, who had a, a lot of experience with the grassroots in the community, even if you are taught how to fish, if you don't have a small pond nearby, you won't be able to fish. And this picture of a fish, the fishing cane and the pond, um, makes me think in class about the three types of service that you can offer. The fish would be direct response to an emergency, the distribution of uh, goods and services, the distribution of information through awareness raising campaigns. The fishing cane is identified as exchange and transfer of knowledge, and the pond with the uh, stimulation to local development processes. And I wonder at the beginning of this pandemic, can we give something more than fish during the pandemic? And the truth is that uh, service learning projects are doing that. Of course, we are paying a lot of attention to emergency situations, projects that bring together service and learning as uh, those uh, engaging uh, health um, students, and then uh, volunteers working in soup kitchens. And with their volunteering efforts, I'm sure they are creating fundamental experiences that can be taken back to the learning side. I loved this example. Perhaps the colleague from, this, from Chile is watching us. She teaches uh, technology, and with her students, they decided to work on building the drawings uh, to create a safe space to differentiate areas that are clean from those that are dirty at home. So children designed that um, they made the drawings. And once they had passed that assignment, they could put this into practice at home. I thought this was an excellent example of what Graciela said at the beginning. This ideology of care, and Joseph Puch is going to talk about that tomorrow. I um, think that service learning is about this. But service learning is also about responding to emergencies with uh, information dissemination campaigns, as the um, University of Valencia did with the students in the School of Law, um, disseminating information about rights children from a rural school in Mexico who developed these infographs uh, on COVID in the native languages and indigenous languages to and taught uh, their communities how to identify fake news. But we also have the transfer of knowledge, the know-how transfer. We have spoken about the virtual tutorials developed by the One university, I can't remember the name now, well, University from Madrid. We also have transfer of knowledge from youth groups, in this case from Italy, and some other experiences that have contributed to local development in times of pandemic. This project, uh, Moraleja, is going to be described in detail in one of the workshops tomorrow about service learning in virtual environments. If you haven't 
been able to register because we were overwhelmed with the number of um, uh, people who register, you will have this information later. These are primary school students who created an interactive space on the internet in order to promote local trade. And they did that with easily replicable tools. Uh, so from different um, fields of knowledge, they were able to apply their knowledge to promote local trade during the pandemic. Earlier, we mentioned the students of the School of Architecture in the Catholic University of Cordoba. This year, in the social and housing um, problems um, chair, they have been working also during the pandemic, uh, contributing with reflection and with awareness, raising efforts to the local development uh, in with an emphasis on housing. So all this can be done at any educational institution. Let me quickly review with you something that you might have heard before, especially if you work in higher education. But I think that perhaps this could be made visible in uh, the pandemic. We always talk about teaching, uh, extension, and research, uh, the pillars of education that could convert into service learning. But not everything has to be service learning. You may have institutional policies that need to cover all the aspects related to the social responsibility of the institution. Service learning combines teaching, research, and outreach or extension. But when you bring together teaching and extension, you have the extension courses, dissemination of information. When you combine extension and research, you have an engaged research. And when you just have extension outreach activities with a volunteering component without the curricular link, you also have a space of its own. All these um, that um, universities have been doing uh, before the pandemic in the world is still continues during times of pandemic. This is a video that was produced by a group of uh, publicly run universities in the peripheral area of Buenos Aires. At the beginning of the pandemic, you could clearly see the educational policy of keeping safe and leaving the classrooms in order to move on to a virtual environment. But this was also linked to engage research, looking for new ways to detect the virus, um, less expensive, faster uh, tests, efforts to find a vaccine, extension activities such as setting up classrooms uh, that could turn into rooms that can host people that need to be isolated, but they have no space at home to be isolated, and then service learning projects. The whole set of these activities turns into what we may call community engagement and social responsibility. It doesn't matter what name we give to it, provided that it continues during the pandemic. But we have seen examples of engaged research, examples of extension and teaching from a virtual setting. And we have seen a lot of volunteering programs in higher education institutions in Argentina and in all parts of the world. I would like to especially acknowledge the efforts of young people, those who remain silent, who do not receive the applauses at night, but who are helping out others during the pandemic in places where help is most needed. And now we come to this question that we need to ask ourselves. What happens the following day, the day after? Once we go into a new normal, as it has happened in China and in Uruguay, you have to go back home. 
yes, we will have to keep a physical distancing. We will have to use uh, hand sanitizer, face masks. You cannot uh, eat in the diner. You have to eat on your desk. But are we just going to have a new normal or are we going also to have a better education system? I think that those of us who are deeply engaged with uh, service learning must know that all the lessons learned during the pandemic on how service learning can be carried out through virtual formats with all the necessary pro precautions, all that has to be applied to the day after. And we need to go back to what we have learned and transform our learnings into best, better educational practices and, if possible, better educational policies. Policies that uh, understand that today, more than ever before, you have a choice between solidarity and irresponsibility. So we either choose to protect ourselves and the others, or we will have no future no matter how many vaccines uh, are developed. So in this regard, I think that those of us who are engaged in service learning practices need to engage in a serious reflection exercise and start to give visibility to the value of solidarity and citizenship responsibility. We need to transform all the volunteering experiences into explicit learning, reflexive learning, so that this will not be just uh, nice experiences. And I think that this is crucial. We need to rethink our service-oriented practices from the point of view of caring and safety, the responsibility we have towards our children and our youth but at the same time, without disrupting our efforts to search for less unequal societies. The pandemic cannot stop us in our search for a less unequal and a less unfair world. And I think that service learning pedagogy as a um, pedagogy of gift and care is uh, perfect to provide a response to all the problems that are derived from the pandemic, to come up with protocols that will enable us to go out of our institutions towards the community in safe conditions so that we can provide assistance to those in need and to recover in each community and at the local level what we have learned, how we can continue doing service learning with these virtual settings, with the face-to-face um, -face settings, or the combined settings. Um, among all the information you can find on the internet, I loved this picture because um, you may speak about the American, the Russian, or the British uh, vaccine, but I think that all of us are the vaccine. We will be able to overcome this pandemic when we um, work in safe conditions, protecting ourselves and the others. And in that regard, I think that service learning practices put us at the forefront to, to build this all together. I don't know whether you are all going to agree with what I'm going to say, but I agree, as Jorge San Martin was saying, that the pandemic has uh, given us much more uh, solidarity. But this doesn't mean that we need to forget that there were in the international organizations, governments that did not protect their citizens as fast as uh, it was required, and that not all countries in the world are addressing the health, educational, and uh, social impacts of the pandemic on an equal basis. And this 
gives us a bigger responsibility because in each community organization, in each educational institution, in each social group, we have now the opportunity to work in a bottom-up approach to develop a culture of solidarity and caring and also to build this vaccine for all. Thank you so much for your attention and for listening to me. And please visit our website, download the virtual bag of materials or, or whatever documents you find useful. I invite you. If you already know about service learning and you want to learn more or you want to certify your knowledge uh, to participate in the diploma that we have launched for the second cohort, and we remain at your disposal knowing that all of us are the vaccine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nieves, for your presentation. So uh, now we have uh, some minutes to answer some questions. First, I have some administrative announcements, but there are many questions in the chat as well. If you have registered and if you have not received the email with the bag of materials or you haven't received the link, please go to your spam in your email because it may be there and perhaps you haven't realized you got it. But even then, if you have registered and you haven't received it there, you send us an email to info at .ar so you, we can send you the material. So please uh, bear with us. If you haven't registered, we cannot give you access to the Zoom sessions because they are fully covered. So for Thursday and Friday, only those that have registered will receive the link for joining the sessions. For the plenary sessions that are broadcast over YouTube, you're all invited whether you have registered or not. So we have some minutes now for some questions to Nieves. I remind you that apart from the chat, the questions have to be uh, written in the form that appears at the bottom of the description in this YouTube channel, at the bottom of this broadcast, you will see a, a link that will lead you to the questions uh, form. You can write your questions there. You have time. I will be seeing the questions online. I will pick a few. We ask for your understanding. I'm not going to have the time to read all the questions in the time we have available. And let me just mention that um, Several of our keynote speakers in the following days are present in the chat and they're answering the questions uh, live. I've seen some of them. Charovage is there. Andy Furco is in the English transmission. Joseph Pooch is there. Many specialists are present in the chat as you would be able to see them along the corridors in a live seminar. So use this opportunity to send your greetings as well. So Nieves, are you ready for some questions? There are several questions that deal with this idea of how can we do service learning in this context where we cannot, we cannot go out to the fields. You said something in your presentation, but perhaps you would like to go deeper into that. We have questions from Mendoza, Lima, Berizo, Spain. There are several questions that have to do with that. How can we do service learning in this context? And several questions refer specifically to how can we do what they were usually doing in the past normality or those things that require a physical presence and are not being done now. Can you say something about it? Thank you, Kike. I think that this is the question, the big question in this context. And I think that on the one hand, many projects have already developed new strategies. I'm thinking, for instance, on many experiences from Spain of schools that were working with the elderly that live 
in an asylum. Well, the asylum is not accessible now. We can have um, access there in these uh, homes for the elderly. So the students recovered that craft, that art of writing uh, letters, and perhaps they shot some videos from their own homes to send messages to the elderly there to make them feel that they were not alone in that elderly home, that they were, they were still with them. And then there are community gardens that turned in Argentina into a promotion of the family garden. So the work that we're doing in the community garden is now being done in uh, their family garden through virtual guidelines so that every student could do it in their backyard. I think that here we have to be very creative so that everything that can be done during lockdown can be uh, done either virtually or perhaps adapted to situations to uh, continue doing that in the homes. Having said this, it's true that in many countries they're already moving to different phases with more opening. In the north, they are expecting to start classes in September in Latin America. Uruguay has their schools open in almost all cases. So in this probable duality that we will have for a long time or until the vaccine is uh, applied, this combination between face-to-face -face and virtual classes, I would say that the first rule is that the same rules that apply to going out of the school in normal conditions, they have to rule the service learning projects as well. That is, if we have to maintain the social distancing, let's do it. But I've seen, for instance, students that are distributing food to the homeless in the streets of Buenos Aires. They, man they maintain the distance. They wear the face masks, gloves, but they keep distributing food. So it is possible to keep uh, working on projects. Some will be easier than others. I think that here it's essential to learn from one another. And those that have found the way out to coming out of the school in a safe manner, well, share that immediately over the social media or through the map or different ways so we can learn from one another and we can see, oh, look, this project of this tutorship is now being adapted to virtuality. This one is still done face-to-face uh, -face in this manner. So I think we are all learning to live in a different world. And I think that one of the keys for success in service learning is the networks that we have among us. So I think it is very important for service learning to circulate very rapidly through our networks. Is there any other question, Kike? Well, I remember when I worked at the radio in my student group in at the university and what we did at that time was to manage the radio station. So I feel I'm doing that again. It's 4.33 here in Argentina, and we are broadcasting live over streaming. There are some mentions here. I can answer that. Some question here from Ukraine, and many are asking about communications, uh, banks of experiences, you can, or publications. We have a platform, actually, where you can upload your experiences during the pandemic. I will share that with you later. And of course, all our publications include publications that are specifically about experiences. So I can answer that question quickly. Then there are some questions related to public policies, different questions. For instance, how can we have public policies for the promotion of service learning? How can we, from civil society, make the governments take these initiatives? There are many present in the chat, many friends and colleagues from the service learning uh, program for the Ministry of Education in Argentina that promotes service learning and has done that for many years. My greetings for them. So the question is for you, Nieves. So from Chile, Peru, and many provinces, how 
can we from civil society push for public policies and how can we reinforce that? Let's see. I'm going to start by saying something that can sound obvious, but I will turn on the light because it's dark suddenly here. There's a storm apparently in Buenos Aires. I started as a history teacher in a public school, a free school in the suburbs, the most vulnerable part of Buenos Aires. For those who know, the area is La Matanza. And at that time, as a recently graduate teacher, I thought that the Ministry of Education had a huge power and that he, it was being wasted. When I became an official at the Ministry of Education, I realized that the ministry could write beautiful documents, but if the teachers didn't agree with that and they didn't follow the proposals, nothing happened. And that was a strong lesson for me, and I believe that true changes happen when what is done top to bottom agrees with what is done bottom to top. So I think that we, we don't have to wait for everything to come from public policies. And we shouldn't believe either that from civil society and educational institutions, we can do everything. Because none of us can do everything on our own. So I think that there are some experiences, very positive experiences, and I invite you to explore them around the world. I'm thinking of Singapore, for instance, with decades of policies for the promotion of service learning. I was so touched when I was in um, in the Asian Network Conference on Service Learning, and I heard the Minister of Social Development say that he had started doing service learning when he was at elementary school. So having ministries and public officials that know what this is about because they did it themselves was a wonderful thing. But there are many countries as well, like Spain, Argentina, and Uruguay, where public policies started in some cases based on the experience of the schools themselves. And that was the case in Argentina. In Argentina, from the ministry, we learned how they did service learning by seeing what happened in, this, in the service learning schools in Argentina. In Uruguay, in Spain, it has been the result of this coexistence between civil society and public policies. In Spain, in almost all the autonomous communities, there are centers for the promotion of service learning where they coordinate the efforts of civil society, universities, and public officials to promote service learning in their territories. So I think that the first thing that is necessary is to learn to work together. And we know that it's not easy because we all have our own institutional culture, our flags, our prejudice, and specifically in an, especially in an emergency like this, we have to learn sometimes to make that leap. In Argentina, there's an expression, we have to eat some frogs. Sometimes we have to eat some frogs, that means Okay, I don't like it. I don't like this institution or this person, this politician, but I need to learn how to work with him or her. So that is one first uh, point. The second is where there are public policies, let's take care of them. Let's support the public officials that are working on it, whether we like them or not. Let's support the institutions that are promoting service learning. Let's make them visible. Let's go to the media. Let's disseminate this in the social media. This is a huge innovation, but it doesn't have the marketing of other things in the world of education. None of us is a great guru with millions of followers and influencers at our service, but we are a lot and we need to start being heard. 
in front of the media, the public policies, but also in front of our colleagues and say, this is possible. This is a better way of educating. And in that sense, I think that all of us, from teachers, social leaders, and public officials, we have a responsibility. Thank you, Nieves. I think it's clear. There are several questions that are not related to the pandemic of this context, more general questions that have come up in other seminars, but we know we have uh, some newcomers. Some say they don't find a way to motivate their students to go out of the school. Some say, I'm in a high class uh, school. Others say because of the restrictions imposed by their parents, but several mentioned this thing. We find it difficult for the students to be willing to participate. We always speak about the leadership of the students. We show examples of good practices that have students as the leaders. But we have to admit that sometimes this is not so easy. So what would you say to these teachers? First is that you have to be patient. Because there are other things in education where you push the button, you turn on the screen, and you start the lab experiment. But let's agree that we are perhaps too used to the only motivation for our students to learn being, in many cases, I have to do this, otherwise I'm going to fail, I'm not going to pass grades, I'm going to have a trouble with my parents, or in the case of higher education, otherwise I'm not going to obtain that paper that I need to make a living. And the truth is that we cannot call that motivation. But it is true that very often we rely on that and we, we do as if our students were motivated. That kind of simulation in service learning does not exist. So we have to be patient and take the time to generate it. Because if we fall on the children saying, this year you have to do a service learning project, without first generating the motivation, it would be much more difficult. How can we generate that motivation? I may be naive, but I've seen so many projects so far, and it seems to me that there's a constant feature, and that is that when we offer the children, the teenagers, or the youth the chance to do something concrete, very concrete, and that they will see that produces real outcomes for the benefit of real people. It's very difficult that they don't get excited about it, at least because it's not the same lesson as everywhere as all the time. So I think that although ideally what we say in the books is that the goal of the project needs to be agreed from the beginning with the students, Sometimes offering them a menu of options, things that we have already discussed with the community or with the organizations we trust, and offering them a menu and saying, well, this year we may have the chance of doing this or this or that. What do you think about it? I think that is one way. This is what I call the the menu of options, because in general, if we give them space to discuss what is the option that is the most interesting for them or which of those projects they think has a bigger impact, if we guide the discussion so that they evaluate those projects themselves, sooner or later, they will choose a winner and they will be engaged. That is an option, I think. Another option I've seen that works in many cases is listening, listening and listening to what the students say. I remember one of the very first service learning projects that I identified in Argentina in the 90s was a, a colleague, a history teacher we had studied together 
and she was working at a school, a high school in Patagonia, and she had the course of those that had repeated the grades many times, the repeaters, and they knew that they were going to repeat the first year because they had repeated it for three years, and sometimes the level of uh, bad behavior was so high that uh, sometimes the principal used to call the police station for the police to come and handle the situation. This is for you to have an idea of the level of motivation of the students. The teacher listened and listened and listened to the students until by listening she realized that many of them were hungry and that they had suffered hunger since elementary school and all them had little brothers or sisters in an elementary school and they were also hungry. So she found a project at the Ministry of Social Development that provided funds for community bakeries and she offered the students whether they would like to learn to write the project and apply for this project, this funding, because she was offering a response to something that was already among them. And so the students got engaged, they were very excited about it, and they worked on it. They managed to pass the year, they graduated, and they managed this, that community bakery. And finally, there's a third thing that perhaps um, applies to those that work with children and teenagers whose basic needs are met and who have parents that are afraid of the poor when perhaps the, they have uh, they are phobic of the poor and sometimes they are very worried about their grades in you know, computing and math but not so much about their service value so in that context I'm quite quite Machiavellic and starting to explain that Harvard, Louvain, and the most prestigious universities in the world have service learning projects because it's one of the pedagogical proposals that have a higher impact on the quality of learning. So if you want your kid to have a master's degree or an MBA in Harvard, well, he will have to do some service learning. It's mandatory and you will have to include service learning among the things he did if he wants to pass. It's quite Machiavellic, but sometimes it works. But basically, I think that those children in those social conditions, consciously or unconsciously, they are willing, as one of these kids once told me, to come out of the box because even if we realize it or not, many times they know themselves that they're growing in a bubble of protection. And when they come out of that bubble, they will crash against reality. So it seems to me that speaking out clearly about these topics, about how harmful it is for them to live in to live in that box in that bubble not being in contact with reality and helping them find out what happens around them and sometimes that requires a lot of personal follow up from the teacher because coming from a privileged position when you are in contact for the first time with poverty, with problems in the community they were not aware of, then some things can come up as anger, blame, fear, and those things are feelings that we as educators need to accompany from the reflection that it's an essential component of any service learning project. I, th I think that um, based on the time that we have available, that is as much as I can say. I am listening to you, but now here in Buenos Aires, we have a big thunderstorm. And uh, last week, when we had our meeting, one of our American speakers was also dealing with some weather difficulties. So we are still online. We are still connected. Our uh, colleagues from California who participated in the pre-recorded sessions had also warnings for evacuation in case of fire. So you may have an excess of fire or an excess of water, and we are w fully aware of climate change effects. I'm smiling here because I don't want to start crying. We are still online. One more question. 
There are several people asking about the dynamics of service learning from popular youth uh, church groups. Uh, what groups can do outside the classroom? You refer to this to a certain extent, but it is true that most of your presentation was focused on service learning within the framework of formal education. Would you like to make some comments about service learning in social organizations? Yes, I think it's very important. All of us who have had um, experience in being part of youth organizations know that a lot is learned from being involved in this kind of organizations. I wouldn't be here with you today if at the age of 15 I hadn't participated in a youth or religious uh, uh, movement. I always said that I learned how to speak in front of an audience when I was in the pastoral group uh, in my youth years. Um, earlier than studying methodology at the, um, uh, in the school at the university. Actually, it was a skill that I developed at the age of 14, although I was very shy by them. The truth is that in any youth organization is per se a uh, learning space. If we speak about matters, you can speak about uh, non-recommended learnings. If we speak about uh, service learning, we are talking about learning that is not systematized. Um, what we call in education jargon, uh, the hidden curricular, um, where we learned uh, very concrete uh, lessons, but there are some organizations that have their own curriculum, even if it is not so visible. When I was in that religious group, I was with the Boy Scouts group, and we learned how to organize everything for a camp, uh, how to uh, put on a fire, how to put it out, how to make a knot. So um all social organizations have their own learnings uh, it's not the same to be part of a red cross movement than to be a volunteer in greenpeace in an environmentalist organization where you need some other type of knowledge and where you have a high level of scientific uh, knowledge so i think that in uh, the first step is to make learning content visible in that organization to make it more intended uh, with popular educators, with the organizational leaders. We want them to define what are the learnings that they want to teach. And then these organizations are already involved in service oriented action. So how can we make sure that the knowledge of our own organization can be put into practice through service-oriented actions. If you go into CLIS's website, you will see a manual that we have in Spanish and in English and in French. I don't know, Kike, if you can hear me well, because Zoom is telling me that we are having, I'm having some connection problems. Uh, my Zoom is quite an alarmist. So if you go into that uh, manual, you will see that the Catholic uh, Girl Scouts organized uh, everything they knew about how to organize a camp to offer some recreational activities uh, as holidays for children in a community that could not afford to go uh, away for vacation. So we have to make visible all that knowledge uh, in social organizations in the course that we offer on service learning and how to develop service learning projects we target teachers but also community educators uh, youth uh, organizations leaders and we see a growing number of experiences from civil society social and religious organizations so i encourage you to develop them and to communicate them excellent nieves thank you so much we had received a lot of questions some have not been read but we have also 
um, a surprise for to close this session. We want to share with you a special video that was uh, developed by the Central and Eastern European Service Learning Network that has received CLISIS support for some time. They have a video that they want to share with us. They are launching it for the first time in this uh, uh, opening session. With a technical team, we are going to play this video, and then we come back here just for the closing remarks. At Segovina, and we started to develop together the project. We did a lot in uh, attracting service learning and making it more visible in the region, uh, promoting uh, among other organizations. So people uh, accepted it, people uh, like, started to be engaged. And uh, I met people like from other countries that they were developing a uh, service learning project. And then I, through, I think, the contact with Edina, I met twice. Beings, so we should help each other. In a service learning project, we're not only helping them, but they're helping us to understand how life works in different parts of Romania. Okay, let's do something. Let's do something for the community. Okay. And this is how the first community service project came up. generosity, the humbleness and the openness to leave those differences behind and work constructively towards a common goal is one of the one of the most important aspects of this network. There are some challenges of course. Time is always too short, distance, language barriers sometimes, but we overcome all this. We had some teachers who were, were a little bit reluctant on their engagement part. But the, after we did the training, the teachers, some of them of course, not all, kind of became more engaged and more interested in this process. And they, the, they supported us in, this, in the application of this methodology. methodologies of learning, to engage communities, to bring together with the school in order to have better communities for our children and for our people. Service learning allows students to put into practice what they learn at school or at university. It therefore motivates them to learn more, to learn better. It also empowers communities and teachers and students by having them work together toward a common good. It's not just extracurricular, but also in teaching math or um, geography and biology. And we have many, many teachers that um, try to combine the service learning with the discipline. We are planning to have uh, expanding service learning methodology to other parts of the country, because so far we did it only in Tulsa Canton. Mm -hmm. But now we are expanding it to three more cantons in, in our country. In 2005, I was only one teacher. And now we have more than 30 teachers at the university who are developing our service learning project. It's real. It can be done also in other countries. It was actually a team effort to promote service learning and of course to mentor teams of students and teachers and encourage their initiatives, uh, expand projects and to multiply leadership. The first and basic thing in service learning is the active participation of students. And that is why service learning belongs to young people. Even though we are children, we, we feel like adults because it's a lot of work and it's basically almost student-led. I learned how to be a leader not only by leading others, but also by understanding their needs. Some of the teachers are not used to see the students as leaders. They are the beneficiaries. For us, it was a big challenge to lead the students, lead the project. Uh, you should definitely get involved in the service learning projects. 
because uh, it's not only the way you help the others, it's also really good for your soul because uh, seeing the happiness of the people you help is the best feeling in this world. We need more people to have more hands in order to do more things. When we have more quality projects, we have more teachers who are doing this, we have more head teachers who allow this to happen in their schools. We have more parents who understand the importance of this. And we therefore have more mayors, more ministers of education receiving pressure on this. I uh, really strongly encourage um, both uh, non-profit organizations as well as government institutions to join the network because um, there is a a, tr a treasure of, um, of uh, resources and experience. Bueno, excelente. This has been excellent. As you can see, this video is quite recent. Uh, it is new. We didn't even have time to get the subtitles in Spanish, so we resorted to a simultaneous interpretation. And we thank the interpreters for the work they are doing in this session. But we promise that you will have the, this video with the subtitles on our YouTube channel. We are already doing this in some local languages because this is a network for Central and Eastern Europe, so it involves different countries. So there are some subtitles available. Let me share with you a couple of slides uh, by way of closing this ceremony session, this um, opening ceremony, sorry. Um, here you can see the slides on the screen. Our president, San Martin, uh, mentioned that we launched this program, uh, Uniservitate, that is uh, a service learning program in Catholic higher education. This website is already operational. We invite you to visit it. The website that I mentioned earlier, seminario.class.org, or is the official website for this international conference. It looks really beautiful. We thank the designers for their wonderful work, but there are a lot of activities there. If you visit our website in the activities tab, you will see what we call the activities for the halls or the corridors of the seminar. You can um, also share your experiences in a global map. So we encourage you to visit our website and interact with the website. There are lots of questions that are still coming through the chat panel. We will try to answer them uh, throughout our activities. Uh, but you also can follow us on our social media, uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, um, Instagram. All the tools are available to you. Finally, to conclude with this session, with this opening ceremony, I would like to thank you all for joining us. We will meet again tomorrow at 10 local time. I need to repeat what all institutions say. The vaccine involves us all. We need to keep social distancing, wash our hands, use a face mask. If you have one like mine that uh, with the emblem of your soccer team, you can have a lot of protection. And so well, we will be together uh, in this uh, fight. Uh, Nieves, if you want, you can just say a few words uh, to say goodbye. OK, uh, perhaps uh, both of us can appear here. Thank you so much, Kike, and thank to everyone for all the messages in the chat box. Um, they move so fast that I couldn't read them all, but Later on, I will have a look at them. We'll meet again tomorrow at 10 a.m. local time. We will have two very interesting sessions. In one of them, we ask different experts from different parts of the world to go into more detail about why we need to have solidarity today more than ever before. It is good to listen to other voices. And then we are going to have some sort of uh, virtual cafe, uh, coffee um, among uh, friends, and uh, we are going to have a more informal conversation about 
service learning, what we can do during the pandemic, how different points of view from Asia, um, Europe, the United States, and Latin America. Um, and during the afternoon, we will have the breakout sessions. Once again, we apologize. I've seen your messages in the chat box. We have 3,000 participants for this conference, so this exceeded our expectations. So stay with us. If you couldn't find your email in your spam uh, folder, in your inboxes, um, wait for classes response. But next week, anyway, we will have the videos available on YouTube, and you will be able to watch those sessions. Thank you so much for bearing with us, for your understanding, for joining us, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Nieves. Greetings from you, for you all from Buenos Aires. See you tomorrow.